Welcome to Democratic Television, a program of the Santa Clara County Democratic Party that brings insights, perspectives, and attitudes of our always thoughtful Democratic guests. Our focus today is on local and state government, and our guest is Santa Clara County Supervisor Dave Cortese, who's also a candidate for California State Assembly District 15. Welcome to the show, Dave. Uh, thank you, Bill. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for doing the show with us. So um, uh, our, our audience often likes to hear a bit about what brings our elected officials and candidates to the, their public service. And could you tell us a bit about your background and especially aspects that you feel kind of contributed to and brought you to this place where you are today? Yeah, let me see if I can um, give you the, the short version of a long story. Yes, you know? I'm sure. Um, you know, I grew up here back in the day as part of an orchard farming family when it was the Valley of Heart's Delight and mm -hmm. San Jose and, and the surrounding county was a lot smaller. And uh, for whatever reason, when I was 11 years old, my father, Dominic, decided to challenge a 16-year incumbent on the Board of Supervisors. And in those days, this was sort of a Republican county, believe mm -hmm. it or not, unlike today. Uh, from a, a re registration. With a memory of even many people, uh, the Republican area was there. But it was like that when he was running. It was like that yeah. when he was running, the entire Board of Supervisors were Republicans, mm -hmm. um, unlike recent history or mm -hmm. modern history, I guess it would be now. Uh, so this is 1968, and uh, as we all know, that was uh, um, a tumultuous year politically in a number of ways. Right. Um, I had been in, in the second grade, you know, watching a black and white television um, the day uh, JFK was shot, and mm -hmm. we were all sent home from school. Um, and spent the next three days, you know, watching the proceedings on my home television while school was out. We were all held out of school for a few days. Right. Uh, and, you know, it became one of those things for me um, before I fast forward, you know, at a very early age uh, that I believed that there were good people in government in high places that were there to help you. You know, I think that was the, um, the image that uh, most all Democrats had and maybe most Americans had of, of JFK at that time. Right. Um, but I also had the experience um, a couple of years later, you know, moving forward from 1963 in the second grade, right. uh, to having a, a, a migrant farm worker who was practically a, a member of our extended family mm -hmm. um, who had just gained citizenship, his name was Durley Gonzalez, um, drafted. Wow. And, and right after boot camp, he lost his life on the front lines in Vietnam. And I wrote a letter to my congressman, who happened to be Don Edwards, and he was a pretty new congressman at the time. This is 1966. Wow. Uh, so you were quite young then. I'm 10 years old, and I still have the letter that he wrote back. Mm -hmm. And my premise, you know, which isn't too important nowadays, but is, you know, why isn't the draft uh, more even-handed? You know, right. it seemed to me that we were losing people uh, who were, you know, on the edge of poverty, who Durley was, you know, a hardworking breadwinner for his family, and he had, there was uh, eight younger children in that family, and he was helping to su supply them with uh, income and food on the table. So, um, anyway, the point is, he wrote me back, and, uh, it, you know, that left a huge impression on me. And I realize ever to this day, as an elected official myself, you know, those constituent responses, especially to young people right. like our, our children's age, uh, are so important because it cuts out, you know, some of the cynicism, some of the uh, uh, static they're, they're hearing from the big news outlets or whatever right. it may be. They get a yeah. direct response. Also, the powerlessness that you can feel if you if you ask your government, uh, hey, be accountable to me in some way, and they blow you off, I think that that just contributes to that feeling of powerlessness. And at least... It sounds like you felt like you were hurt. It sounds almost like it was more as important to you that you had a response than, than the substance, specific substance of it. Well, sure. I'm a I'm a, a ten year old kid living on a prune orchard, right. you know, where I had to walk, you know, an eighth of a mile to get to the mailbox on rural Route Three, which right. is now would now be in the middle of twenty five thousand homes in Evergreen, wow. right? But rural Route Three at the time had wow. about nine houses on it, and here's this letter, you know, yes. from the United States Congress, right? Yeah. So um, very personalized. Yeah. But anyway, a, f a few years later, two years later, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, my father uh, decided to jump into politics and um, in, in what was a big campaign in those days, mm -hmm. um, a big challenge kind of a campaign. One is seen on the Board of Supervisors, stayed there for 12 years, went on to serve in the legislature for 16 years, 
um, and then actually served on a school board for four years after that, wow. after he was in the legislature. That's a so long he had a 32 year run. Yeah. Um, partway through that, in 92, I was elected to the Eastside Union High School District Board of Trustees, really out of a feeling of, yes, I'm interested in politics and elected office, but by that time, um, as uh, you know, a young man who was involved in business but also community mm -hmm. efforts, uh, I was on the boards of community-based agencies. I was just trying to do my part to give back. Hey, how about if I give back by being a school board member uh, here in Eastside Union where I grew up? Mm -hmm. And so my father and I actually overlapped for about four years as elected officials. Oh, I didn't realize that. And um, so from 68 on, um, 51 years now, one or the other of us has been representing a significant part of, of the community, you know, geographically and population-wise. and. Um, it's, it's been great. So obviously he was um, a big influence on me. But remember, uh, as uh, you might imagine, I, I, I not remember, but I say that mm -hmm. kind of facetiously, but um, as a 12-year-old kid, you know, I was his number one cheerleader saying, run, run, right. run. You know, yeah. by, then, by then I had already had my interaction with the congressman. By then I was already thinking, wow, my dad could be one of those guys. Wow. And yeah. he was very reticent about running. Yeah you know, against somebody who was entrenched in office at that time. And, and I just remember uh, telling him, you got a lot of friends, you can do it, you know. Wow, you, you can, the, you what we would now call a grassroots you. campaign was yeah. what was in my mind, you know. Right. So I've uh, been around it for a long time and supported, you know, so many great Democrats over the years, besides my father, you yeah. know. It was just not too long after that that I was walking precincts, um, which we actually did here for Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. um, door to door, and you know, so many other candidates, Zoe Lofgren, and uh, right. we were always very, very close with uh, John Vasconcellos, who was a classmate of my father's at Bellarmine in Santa Clara. So, yeah. you know, um, I'm lucky to have had that experience and to have been able to build, really, um, even though I have my own identity and my own career now, mm. but to build uh, on those building blocks that I had in the in the early days. Wow, that, that's fascinating. So y your dad's service on the county uh, board of supervisors, you mentioned, you referred to the, the really vast and really uh, ch the incredible changes that have occurred in Santa Clara County in the time that, from when he was serving to the time that you're serving now. Do you think his experience was, uh, was very different uh, for that reason? Or were there issues different? Were there resources different than they are now? That's a great, a great question, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it, part of the answer to that question is the more things change, the more they stay the same right. in some areas. Mm. For example, immigration. I mean, it, what it, the story I just told you about right. Gurley Gonzalez uh, being an immigrant. I remember my yeah. father um, fighting for his citizenship, our, you know, offering to sponsor him, right. and and then calling the draft board and and arguing with him, you know, trying to get him exempted from the draft mm -hmm. on the basic of hardship to his family. Yeah. Um, and I remember um, at the same time, you know, my father standing with Cesar Chavez, the United Farm Workers, right. and, and later, later hit uh, by the Republican Party for having done that. Later when he was in the legislature and they tried yeah. to take him out, right. <laughs> um, you know, the big hit piece was, was him was standing behind the, the UFW probably banner. Probably half a communist hanging out with uh, yeah, <laughs> Cesar Chavez, yeah. right? And that hasn't changed much. Yeah. Uh, in our party, obviously, uh, you know, and, and even around the globe, Cesar Chavez is considered a great civil rights right. leader. Uh, but as we see from the White House, particularly now, right. uh, this vilification of uh, the labor movement, people of color, people who are trying to get a leg up. Yeah. Um, Immigration, immigrants, lawful or not. Yeah. Right? So it's some terrible. of those issues, yeah. sadly, you know, haven't changed um, enough. Um, the big urban planning issues. Um, while similar, mm. you know, we've made so much progress. Right. You know, they talked about BART, bringing BART down here back in those days. Right, wow. But yeah. there, was, there was no resolve, no real resolve in Santa Clara County and San Mateo County right. to do it, and look what ended up happening. Now we're having to sort of connect it ourselves. But the change is we're doing it. Right. You know, the change is there's right. the kind of economic gravitas here to get some of these things done. Right. Um, instead of a hundred and fifty million dollar a year county budget, yeah. which it was when he was a first elected, wow. it's eight billion dollars a year wow. now. So the power that we have to help yeah. people, the yeah. national stature that we have uh, as a county and as right. a state, 
uh, I think are significantly different than back in those days. Right, I agree, and, and that those are interesting, uh, interesting differences. Um, your dad went to uh, Sacramento, and I know for a lot of legislators that is sort of a, of a commute job. Did you, how did that experience affect you once he entered that phase of service? Uh, did, you, uh, did you ever resent the fact that he was spending so much time helping others? Uh, yeah, you ask great questions, Bill. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, that is, um, that is a, a, a real hidden issue, I yeah. think, to the public. Uh, and I think probably a lot of elected officials, including myself, are reluctant to, you know, to, to talk too much about family sacrifice and make it sound like a, it's a hardship because these, these positions that we're in are such a privilege and such an honor. Right. Uh, and we don't want people to think that um, we're resentful about any part of it because, you know, that's not healthy. Right. Uh, but I'll tell you, I remember my mother coming to me. My father was first elected before he even went to Sacramento yeah. and grabbing me by the shoulders and saying, you know, your father is community property now. Wow. And she wasn't talking about family law. She was talking about right. he is literally owned by the community now. Right. That's his primary responsibility. Sure, family also, but you're going to have to share him now. Right. And Sounds like he, she was being fairly explicit in telling you that, you know, you've just been elected to public service too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and I've heard my kids, um, sometimes in third person, when I overhear them talking to others, Right. They're mostly grown now. The youngest is 19, the youngest of four. Uh, but especially the two older kids who are in their early 30s now, I've heard them talk to people about, you know, we had to sacrifice our, our father, time with our father, but we did it gladly. We did it willingly because we knew that the wow. larger uh, purpose here was to share, you know, to share with, with the broader community. So I think there's some role modeling that happens there right. that kind of compensates for a, a little bit of, short changing and personal time with your family but yeah he started going up there four days a week four and a half days a week right. sometimes in budget lockdowns uh, you know you just like to go on a hike with him or you know sit down and talk talk to him and you know he wouldn't be around and hard on him too i'm sure i bet yeah, yeah i'm sure uh you mentioned uh, your experience at bellarmine i imagine bellarmine changed a lot because you're a grad also is that right yeah between no. the time your dad was there so it's another long-standing inst institution yeah Unfortunately, um, he he was there in the nineteen early nineteen fifties, yeah. um, and uh, it, unfortunately for me and my class, the class of seventy four, there weren't very many improvements to that campus between wow. nineteen fifty <laughs> and nineteen seventy four. Right. I remember the gym doors didn't close all the way, so right. which was not a problem much in an all boys school, relatively speaking, but. Uh, but the pool was out on the other side of those doors, and every once in a while at fifth period PE, they would bring in families uh, for water polo, you know, to watch water polo contests, right. and uh, and you'd have to dash by those doors as fast as you could with a <laughs> towel around you, you know. But the Congrats. school, I think the school since I was there yeah. um, has become a much better school. It's right. a school that... Um, and a commitment the whole time to really, uh, you know, uh, a value of service. Uh, so I'm not surprised that uh, you were able to take that from there. It is. It's, you know, they have this, this motto there, um, men for others or yeah. people for others. But uh, I, think, I think fundamentally what they've done at that school, my, my youngest son actually went there. He's yeah. the, the only one of uh, my kids that went to yeah. school uh, there. And um, the kinship you know, is, is something I think we could relate to as a party, you yeah. know, in terms of a value. Emphasizing kinship, emphasizing inclusiveness on that campus, which really wasn't a thing when I went there, you yeah. know. Very good. So it's good to see that. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. And in the second half, we'll talk a bit about the work you've done as supervisor and about your campaign. Thanks so much, Dave. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name's Steve Preminger, and I'm a longtime Democratic Party activist. I'd like to urge you to get involved in the Democratic Party. Uh, the times, they are perilous. We have a new president who I think is intending to dismantle a lot of the progressive gains that we've gotten as Democrats and as citizens of this country. Uh, give the local Democratic Party a call at 408-445-9500. Help make a difference. Welcome back for the second half of our DTV show with Supervisor Dave Cortese. Dave, uh, thank you for the conversation we had in our first segment. 
And uh, uh, there's so much we could talk about in terms of your public service, uh, school board and city council, um, running as a Democratic not, uh, supported and endorsed candidate for, for mayor, mm -hmm. and then uh, for a good long stand now, uh, county supervisor in Santa Clara County. Um, and we talked about change. Uh, there's uh, Google's having a big expansion in San Jose. A, a lot of that change has created opportunity. A lot of, of it has created challenges as well. And I know that the county um, is a big social service provider. I think as Democrats, uh, you know, you and Cindy Chavez and Ken Yeager uh, and others on, on, on the Board of Supervisors, we've sort of felt like we've had an all-star team uh, during a pretty critical time. Oh, uh, and, and what would you say are the things that are the, the challenges that you feel like we're still working on and the ones that maybe you're proud to have, uh, uh, you know, really taken in hand as, as, as a Board of Supervisors? Well, you know, you go back to the time when I was on the city council mm -hmm. and uh, you know, people like Amy Dean and later, later, later uh, uh, Phaedra Ellis Lampkins on, on the labor council side, the working partnership side here in this county, you know, Democratic uh, uh, Party advocates and activists in their own right mm -hmm. were pushing community benefits as something that was going to be needed. You know, mm -hmm. they, the foresight to say, if we don't start thinking about affordable housing, extremely low income housing, uh, we're going to get caught in um, you know in this in an economic cycle that starts to displace people, mm -hmm. that starts to grow uh, the number of poverty wage people that we have here in the county and in in our major city in San Jose. Mm -hmm. And boy, were they right! You know, mm -hmm. and and all the rest of us who were saying that at that time, I was certainly uh, on that side of of the argument. Uh, I guess the right side of history in a way right. when I was on the city council, but the wrong side of history in the sense that. Nobody wanted that to happen. We were just trying to fight for those things. And now when you see Google coming in, the, the blessing for county government, for example, is that what they're doing, the property that they're buying, the, the improvements that they're going to build, the mm -hmm. physical improvements, will right. raise the property tax base. Right. And the county gets a big chunk of that money, yeah. uh, which we can then turn around and use for safety net services for all the things that we do, 40 departments and agencies and you know, a very large budget now. Right. The problem is, uh, you know, it's not worth getting that tax revenue if you're just gonna have to dump it right back into the area, you know, to mitigate the people who, uh, the needs of the people who have been marginalized or displaced. Right. And we have a housing crisis. Uh, our homeless numbers, despite uh, huge efforts that, that we've been doing as a county, are still spiking up a little bit. Right. And, and you have to worry about Google or anybody else, you know, doing major uh, physical expansion um, and even workforce expansion mm -hmm. um, without making sure we have the proper community benefits analysis. So I think it's 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 not only still an issue, but um, I think, again, uh, people who were making that argument 15 years ago have proven to be spot well, on. And, and, yeah. and yeah, now we need to catch up in, yeah. in a hurry, and we can't uh, let anybody off the hook anymore. Right. Uh, I, I know that a lot of those problems and issues that have to be addressed, especially in San Jose, uh, there's overlap or, or shared responsibility or maybe even siloed responsibility between the, the city and the county. Do you feel like the city of San Jose and the, and the county have been able to work together to solve and address some of these problems, or is that you know, kind of an ongoing challenge? You know, after that mayor's race that you uh, were referring to, yeah. um, and you know, I'm forever grateful to the Democratic Party and all mm -hmm. the folks uh, who were allies on my side in that race, a, a race that came down to a 0.76% yes, swing. But it was, um, um, you know, it was a, a time right after that race where I became president of the Board of Supervisors for three consecutive years. And I, I really tried to go out of my way to not only patch up any differences um, right. with the mayor, but also to develop um, some new partnerships with San Jose. One of them was the All the Way Home campaign, which has now housed about 1,500 homeless veterans. Wow. Uh, but also to, to to try to find ways to communicate other than through our attorneys, you know, right. uh, yes. to, to try to uh, work together politically wherever we could, mm -hmm. uh, because basically city and county residents, wherever they overlap, are, are, are the, cons the same constituents, the same taxpayers for, for all of us. And, and suffering um, or not, right. you know, from the same symptoms that are out there uh, in the community, whether it's rampant uh, opportunity and job growth or displacements and, and poverty and, and other issues. So right. we need to work together on them. And I think we've done a much better job the last few years um, shifting that paradigm and at least outwardly, right. uh, you know, 
the part of us that's facing the public, mm -hmm. uh, city and county, looks a lot more cooperative now, and I think that's a good message for the people. I agree with you. Uh, so uh, I know that you've also invested a lot of time in uh, seeking out and pursuing opportunities to uh, look at regional uh, solutions to some of these problems, like housing, for example. Can you speak a little bit about that? I mean, because Santa Clara County, it's not an island. It can't do things on its own. Yeah, uh, you can't. In things like climate, uh, you know, climate change, which is perhaps the um, existential issue of our time, really, uh, it doesn't res that issue doesn't respect district boundaries, right. municipal boundaries. It doesn't even it doesn't even follow yes. national boundaries for that yeah. matter. And uh, it, it's something we've taken on very aggressively. I've taken on very aggressively as a county supervisor. But on the regional level. Um, if I can explain this in a minute or less, yeah. one of the things that um, we've had to do by state mandate uh, under a, a bill called SB 375 uh, that's a few years old now, we have to put a regional plan together that ties transportation and housing together in a way that reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Right. And that's measured constantly. And every seven years, we have to renew that plan. Right. And that's why... Th things like housing production are so important, especially housing production that's proximate to transportation right. that reduces vehicle trips, which then reduces emissions, which then reduces our GHG. And that's why you see folks like Senator Weiner, you know, uh, maybe, you know, ruffling some feathers and right. rubbing a few people the wrong way because he's very aggressive about if, if we say we're going to build this housing, you know, next to a transit line, we have to actually do it. Right. You know, because <laughs> our, our, literally our environment and our, our way of life, our ability to live in the places where we live is dependent upon that. So right. um, it's been an eye opener yeah. at regional at the regional level. I bet. Uh, at the MTC and Association of Barry Governments where a lot of that action is, where, right. where I get to work and I yeah. have for the last 17 years. Yeah. It's, it's been a, an eye opener to, to, to be there and witness this and participate. Right. The um, one thing that I have noticed is that uh, younger activists uh, representing their generation are, are very impassioned about things like housing and, 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 and climate change. They feel very strongly affected by it. And it's one of those areas where they feel sort of like where, you know, we've done as our generation has done some things right, but to them, uh, we're kind of behind on. So uh, I appreciate your commitment to that. Um, that seems like a very natural, that interest in housing and transportation and transit-oriented housing and all the things you've done as a supervisor seem very naturally um, uh, related to opportunities in Sacramento, but what are the things that make you want to take that step and become a state senator? Well, it is, it is those things and a few more issues um, that make me very excited about getting to Sacramento right now. I, mm -hmm. I, I often say over the last few years in Santa Clara County, we've been leading, not not following. We haven't right. been waiting for the state to see what they do or anybody yeah. else for that matter. But what's a specific thing? Because I agree with you, and, and uh, I'm thinking of like lawsuits against Trump, but also policy things. What we what, what kind of things do you have in mind? Well, that you know, we were the first county in the country to to come out um, and and tell President Trump you can't extort money from us. Right. Um, you can't extort money from us as a way to try to get us to to violate the due process rights of immigrants. Right. People out there don't understand that issue very well, and I won't get too deep into it, but understand, please, mm -hmm. that when someone commits a crime, a felony, a violent crime, they're prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law here in Santa Clara County, right. regardless of their status. Mm -hmm. But if a judge sets them free mm -hmm. under the Constitution of the United States because they've done their time, or they're proved to be acquitted, um, we respect those constitutional due process rights. We don't right. call ourselves a sanctuary county, we call ourselves a constitutional county. Mm -hmm. And I think the state um, has done much, but we need people in Sacramento that are gonna reinforce the, you know, and, uh, that commi commitment and rededicate to the commitment of California is not trying to secede from the union. California right. is trying to uh, lead the nation on constitutional rights I think we're doing it on climate issues. Um, I think we're doing it on jail reform, which is equivalent of prison reform at the state level. Right. Um, and I think on health care, you know, we now have one of the largest health care systems in the county here, public health care systems. Um, obviously, there's so much to do at the state level uh, on the issue of health care. Right. So um, I'm eager to get there. It just feels like one of those points in time in history where everything I've done to this point 
you know, has prepared me to land on my feet running in Sacramento and, and shake things up and move things in the right direction. Wonderful. So um, uh, if uh, viewers were interested in learning more about your state Senate campaign, uh, uh, which, what's your web uh, address that they would go to to get that information? It's www, of course, davecortezzi.com. Okay, that's straightforward. Folks, mm -hmm. I'm sure, can find information there and reach out to you as well. We, I would appreciate yeah. that. You know, campaigns uh, require a lot of things, as we know, um, fundraising and all kinds of things. But more than anything, we have been successful over the years because of volunteerism, yeah. uh, because of activism, because of good Democrats who have stepped up and said, I can give a little time on a Saturday or a Thursday right. evening to help out. So if you're interested, yeah. yes, absolutely, let us know. Fabulous. What's one thing that surprised you in campaigning for state senate? Have you, have you, has anything you know, uh, been something other than you expected uh, in, that, in, this, in that journey? You know, so far, um, we've been on the campaign side, this uh, strategic side of things, been experiencing just tremendous growth. The, the campaign became very powerful and very successful very quickly. I hope it stays that way. We yeah. still have a little ways to go. In terms of state issues, um, I don't know why this surprises me, and it'll probably get a chuckle out of most people, but in interacting with people a little bit more closely in Sacramento, it is amazing to me <laughs> Uh, some of the things that are so easy to fix that just haven't been fixed, that just haven't been tackled. Um, and then some of the bigger issues that have been festering for years, like opening up the education code uh, right. to bring about the reforms that we'd all like to see. So, um, you know, because I've been so immersed in county government and trying to protect us, uh, yes. especially against the Trump administration, um, this has kind of allowed me an opportunity to go see you know, some of these latent defects we see in, in, uh, in, in the work in Sacramento and the politics of Sacramento that can yeah. be resolved, I think, with, uh, with some energy. Well, you've been getting a lot done in, Sac in Santa Clara County, so I'm sure you'll be able to help move those things forward. So thanks for your time today, Dave. Sure, thank you. Thank you for watching DTV. Give us a call at 408-445-9500 or visit our website at www.sccdp.org. Help us to make a difference. We'll see you on the campaign trail. <laughs>